Yeah, it's more than that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Simon Doubleday, Professor of History here at Hofstra University. I'd like to welcome you all very warmly uh, here to campus today uh, to the second of two debates featuring mixed teams, including four members of the Cambridge Union Society from Cambridge University in the UK, uh, which is one of the oldest debating societies in the world. Uh, the debates will also feature four Hofstra student debaters. We'll be introducing them all very shortly. Uh, a warm welcome also to those of you who are watching online because uh, this debate is being broadcast live on the web to a number of high schools on Long Island. Over the past two days, uh, the Cambridge University students, uh, Rachel, John, Poppy and Matt, uh, who we'll be introducing formally in just a second, uh, have led a wonderful series of workshops which have really uh, energized the campus, uh, tremendous intellectual en energy has been generated and we hope this will be uh, not a one-off occasion, not a unique occasion, but the first of many visits that uh, the Cambridge Union Society is able to make to our campus. Uh, yesterday, alongside four outstanding Hofstra students, they debated whether or not society needs the super rich. Uh, the answer turns out to be no, by the way. Uh, <laughs> today, with four new Hofstra debaters, they'll be uh, addressing a question that really needs no uh, introduction, uh, a question that has dominated headlines across the world for uh, many of the recent months. Should Edward Snowden be considered a hero, or perhaps as something completely different? Before we begin, I'd like to express my gratitude to a number of people, beginning with Dean Warren Fresina of the Hofstra Honours College, for his commitment and his enthusiasm to making this event uh, possible and also to Professor Philip Dalton, the Chair of the Rhetoric Department in the Herbert Lawrence School of Communication, who has worked unstintingly to prepare our student debaters for today's event and yesterday's event. I'd like to reiterate our thanks to uh, Ms. Athleen Collins, Director of Hofstra's Cultural Centre and her staff, including Carol Mallison and Amy Trotter, during what is an exceptionally busy and uh, productive and exciting semester of events on campus. It's not every year that the Brazilian football player Pele comes to receive an honorary degree from Hofstra University, uh, as will be happening here at a conference entitled Soccer as the Beautiful Game, uh, to be held here between the 10th and 13th of April, I believe. And there are brochures outside if you're interested and would like to have your picture taken with Pele. Um, <laughs> Warm thanks also to Colin Sullivan of University Relations for promoting these Hofstra uh, Cambridge debates so energetically. 
These debates have several sponsors, including firstly the Honours College Pete Tallaher Memorial Fund. We're honoured and delighted that uh, Pete's parents, Christopher and Suzanne, and his sister Elizabeth can be with us here again today, and we deeply appreciate their generosity. Among our other sponsors are Bernard Firestone, Dean of the Hofstra College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Evan Cornog, Dean of the Lawrence Herbert School of Communications, and Provost Hermann Berliner. Now finally, before we uh, turn to the uh, major debate, I'd like to explain quickly how we'll be determining the winner of today's uh, discussions, today's debate. Um, as you can see from the screen, we're asking audience members, uh, both here and uh, online, to indicate their position on our question by texting in an answer to the number which you can see on the screen. We'll be doing this, of course, before the debate takes place. And you simply need to t uh, send a text message to uh, 22333, inserting the code number associated with the position that you want to take into the body of your message. So we'll leave you a minute to do that. And then when the debate is over, there'll be a second opportunity to vote, and we'll be able to see uh, how the cookie has crumbled, how the vote has swung and will be essentially determining the winner based on the swing that has taken place over the next hour. While you're voting, please allow me finally to uh, introduce our moderator, who will be uh, in turn introducing our uh, debate team members today and guiding us through the proceedings, Professor Philip Dalton. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Phil Dalton. I'm the chair of the Department of Rhetoric here at Hofstra University. And uh, for today's purposes, I'll be the Speaker of the House. Um, I'd also like to thank the Cambridge debaters for uh, the time they've spent here and uh, the effort they've put into uh, spreading the gift of debate uh, to our campus and to the uh, high schools that have come and gone from campus. But in addition, I want to recognize the students from Hofstra who have taken a, a crash course uh, in debate um, in order to prepare for this debate. Uh, they've done a fabulous job in a very short amount of time. And in addition to the uh, students who've made it on stage, there are two who should be recognized for their efforts in helping uh, prepare and foster discussion while training. And th those students are Daniel Coonan uh, and Reagan Ham. So uh, thank you to uh, all of you. Um, one reason we had to take a crash course is because we don't have a, a debate team on campus, but that changes next year. So uh, if you're interested in debate, speech and debate, um, individual events, uh, come talk to me, call me, harass me by email. Uh, I, I wouldn't look at it as harassment. I'm excited about this and uh, hope, uh, hope you can participate. Moving on, um, today's debate will roughly model a, a form of debate called British Parliamentary Debate, which has its origins in British Parliamentary Procedure. And the debate is divided between the government, which is arguing for the resolution today, and the opposition, which is opposing the resolution. Now, there are four people on either side, a combination of both Cambridge Union Society debaters and Hofstra University debaters. Uh, arguing for the government is Hofstra's Amanda Donato, uh, Cambridge, Cambridge's Rachel Tukey, Cambridge's Poppy Damon, and Hofstra's Rory Deering. Arguing uh, for the opposition are Hofstra's Sam Anglis, uh, Cambridge's John Papantonio, uh, Hofstra's Thomas Montefinis, and Cambridge's Matt Hazel. Each speaker will speak for as many as seven minutes, and the first and last minute of their presentations, uh, as indi indicated by one wrap of, of my gavel here, uh, will go in uninterrupted. And during the intervening period, opposing debaters are invited to make as many as uh, two points of information, and they'll ask questions of the speaker. It's up to the speaker to decide whether or not he or she will accept the question. The first six speakers will construct the arguments in this debate. They'll offer a contentions in support of, of the resolution, rejection of the resolution. They'll offer extension of their teammates' arguments and offer refutation of their opponents' arguments. 
Following those first six speakers, we'll open the floor to uh, floor debate. Uh, and at that time, and I'll make note of this, uh, you're invited to come down to this aisle. There will be a microphone there. And you can direct points, comments to uh, the debaters or indicate questions that haven't been adequately answered for you during the debate. They won't respond to the questions and comments at that moment, uh, but the final two debaters who will come up uh, with the, the purpose of wrapping up the argument and convincing you why their team uh, has won the debate, uh, they may choose to respond to the questions and comments that you've raised. So with, uh, with that said, I'd like to invite and Amanda Donato to the lectern. I would first like to start out by thanking the Cambridge Union Society for joining us this great distance to debate with us today. It's an honor and pleasure to have you here. I would also like to thank Hofstra University for organizing this event. I would personally like to thank the professors that spent countless hours meeting with us to help us develop and understand our topics for debate. And lastly, I would like to thank the audience for joining us in this fine occasion. Today, we will be discussing whether or not Edward Snowden is a hero. As many of you all know, Edward Snowden was a former NSA contractor who released thousands of documents to various outlets which concretely showed how the government invades the public's privacy without any grounds. Many people argue if what Edward Snowden did is heroic or is not. Now, I want you all to think about this for a minute. Edward Snowden gave up everything he had, his girlfriend, his job, and his home by releasing these documents. He did so for the public good. It's our right as American citizens to know what goes on in the government. The famous quote by Abraham Lincoln states that our government is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We deserve to know what is going on in our government because our government claims its fundamental structure is based upon equality. Um. Edward Snowden released these secret documents to show you as citizens the truth. He wanted to show the true nature of the government. Edward Snowden is an advocate for our constitutional rights to privacy. The Fourth Amendment states that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Although the searches executed by the NSA were technically backed by warrants, many of the warrants had no grounds. Releasing these documents helps support his position while also showing how the government abuses their power. Resolution be it, Edward Snowden is most definitely a hero. Before getting into contentions, I would like to define some key terms which will help support the arguments which support the resolution that Edward Snowden is a hero. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a hero can be defined as a person who is admired or idolized for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. I would also like to add that we believe a hero is a person who has the willingness to make a personal sacrifice for the benefit of others and for a better world, and not for an enemy nation or organization. In further arguments on the government side, we will discuss the net benefits his actions led to. Edward Snowden is a hero because he had the courage to release thousands of private documents which exposed the privacy violated by the NSA. What Edward Snowden has done has opened up the eyes of everyone who uses technology. He gave us concrete evidence that Big Brother is watching. Snowden proves to us the time, money, and resources spent trying to protect us with more intense security has stopped nothing. Some may argue that Snowden went took the contractor position with the NSA because he had the intent to release information. I must add that this is an act of heroism. He suspected foul play by the government and was noble enough to sacrifice his freedom to publish the information which proves this foul play. Edward Snowden believes that we as citizens deserve the right to know what is going on in the government and that we should not be lied to. The value we, we will be discussing today is transparency and democracy. We live in a government which claims we are all equal, however contradicts them 
by denying us access to information and invades our privacy with no grounds. We pay taxes, we vote, we fight in war, and because of this, we deserve the right to knowledge. Inclusion and democracy is key for being informed on all matters, as well as because democracy relies on feedback, and feedback cannot be given without information at all. Snowden heroically fights for this transparency. According to the whitehouse.gov, transparency promotes accountability and provides information for citizens about what their government is doing. Information maintained by the federal government is a national asset. The administration will take appropriate action consistent with law and policy to disclose information rapidly in forms that the public can readily find and use. Executive departments and agencies should harness new technologies to put information about their operations and decisions online readily available to the public. Executive departments and agencies should also solicit public feedback to identify information of greatest use to the public. The first contention I would like to make is that Edward Snowden has allowed for us to critically observe the government and criticize its practices. In releasing these private documents, Edward Snowden revealed the secretive spying techniques enacted upon US citizens, which were essentially a waste of time. There was no systematic reasoning behind it. Essentially, Snowden gives us concrete evidence which proves what many citizens had suspected. The Guardian has noted that before his disclosures, most experts already assumed that the United States conducted cyber attacks against China, bugged European institutions, and monitored global internet communications. Even his most explosive revelation, that the United States and the United Kingdom had compromised key communication softwares and encryption systems designed to protect online privacy and security, merely confirmed what knowledge observers had long suspected. Additionally, Edward Snowden adds that, we spent all this money, we spent all this time hacking into Google's and Facebook's back end to look at their databases. What did we get out of that? We got nothing. In June 2013, the Washington Post revealed the PRISM program, which allows the NSA to tap into major US internet companies to collect emails, videos, images, and other materials. The program was revealed after a PowerPoint presentation was released. These quotes help show that there is no reason to hide information when it's something that is suspected. As far as transparency of government, it's important to know what goes on and what our money is being spent on. The fact that the money funding the NSA is supported by US citizens is not going towards a purpose that is proved to accomplish nothing. Edward Snowden's actions give us transparency of government. The government feels defensive because we have the facts to criticize its practices. A subpoint of the contention I would like to discuss is that when Edward Snowden revealed to us or gave us transparency, the government's loose and unjust violation and interpretation of, the constitu of constitutional rights was exposed. Edward Snowden notes that the interpretation of the Constitution had been changed in secret from no unreasonable search and seizure to any seizure is fine, just don't search it. That's something the public ought to know. Thank you. Our next speaker for the opposition is Sam Anglis. And before he speaks, I'd like to clarify. Um, the first minute of the speech is uninterrupted. I indicate the end of the first minute with a rap of my gavel. That's why I'm tapping over here. Uh, and then at the end of six minutes, I'll tap again, and that goes uninterrupted for another minute. That intervening period then uh, is when points of information can be asked of the speaker. So please, Sam. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking all you in the audience for taking the time out of your day to come and appreciate the hard work that we've all worked on. Uh, second, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Doubleday and Mr. Speaker and Hofstra University for uh, giving us this opportunity. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, my fellow Hofstra debaters and the debaters from the Cambridge Union Society for joining me today in trying to find the truth on, on, about Edward Snowden. All right, so, is Edward Snowden a hero? In short, no. You see, uh, contrary to what the, the, the government has offered, the issue at hand today is between privacy and security. This house believes that we need both, but in balance. See, with too much security, there's, we're, we're, in a, we're locked in a cell. With too much privacy, well, with too much privacy there, we're vulnerable. We have nothing to protect us. 
So the real question we should be asking today is whether or not the NSA violated enough privacy to sacrifice the security which Snowden destroyed in the NSA. The truth is, it didn't. The, the, NSA, the NSA surveillance was not nearly as intrusive as the government would like you to believe. And the, the security benefits were far greater than, they were, than, than what they're telling you. So but before, I'd like, before I get into my contention, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to offer a couple of rebuttals to, to uh, the government's proposition. See, the government says that the, that the United States has to be completely transparent with everything it does. This, this, if we were to follow this, would make us so vulnerable. For, uh, for example, if we were to uh, tell, tell everyone about uh, where, we, where we're placing our soldiers, where we're, what tactics that our soldiers are using, then it would make us, it would make us defenseless. Uh, the, our enemies would be able to, to destroy the people both on, on the fields fighting for America and they'd be able to bypass them and, and, and get us here at home. So that, that's kind of ridiculous. Uh, for privacy, they, they, they claim that, uh, they, they cite the Fourth Amendment saying that uh, they, that the warrants that they do, that we, that we do get at the FISA courts are, are invalid. To be honest, how could anyone know what these, what goes on in the FISA courts? This is, these, these courts are secret, all right? And we have to trust that the, that the judges appointed for the surveillance court know a lot about surveillance and that, that they're, they're especially trained to, to handle these issues, and they are. Um, and they, they also, uh, say that that the, that there is no security offered by this by the NSA, and this is this is completely untrue. And I'll, I'll go on to that a little more later. But uh, so first, my contention is that uh, Edward Snowden has put a massive hole in, in our security system uh, for a, a minuscule gain of privacy, and this has this has set us back huge in American society. It does, has not benefited us; it's set us back. All right. In order to understand how much privacy the NSA is really violating, we first have to understand how the NSA works. What they do is they get a bunch of metadata, right? And they so they talk about who is who's contacting whom, and they 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 run it by uh, a list of of affiliated people that are affiliated with terrorists, and to create a new list these uh, of people that are actually speaking with terrorists. And uh, so what they do with that list is they go individually through each person and see if each per and see if they meet a certain profile. Then they take it to the FISA court, get, try and get a warrant. And if they get a warrant, they can go to corporations such as Google and Facebook and things like that to get the actual hard data uh, on, uh, on what is actually said between the people. But the NSA is, has taken, has created procedures to minimize the amount of, sec of privacy that they actually intrude upon. They, what they do is they filter out all the personal information that, uh, that is unnecessary to privacy. They, they filter it out so it's only uh, messages between the person of interest and the person affiliated with terrorism. Then what they do is they filter it even further so it's only these messages that, these messages and only the messages that have certain keywords, certain safety words such as bomb, explosion, uh, evacuations, and casualties. Uh, I'll take that later. Um, and so it's it's words that that make the the government think that something is a some that this person is threatening us. All right. And so w really, what it is is the only privacy that is being slightly invaded is. The privacy between one sketchy person talking to another sketchy person about things that are sketchy, like about <laughs> bombs. All right. So, and the th thing is, this really does increase our security. Like, for example, there was this man named uh, Zazzy, and he, uh, no, thank you, uh, he, uh, man named Zazzy. Zazzy was found on this on this list to to be talking with terrorists, right? And they, 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 they met a profile, went over to FISA, got a, got a warrant from FISA, went to Google and Facebook, got the information from there, ran this data through this, uh, through this filtration system twice, and then w the only time that the NSA actually like, got to read it was after this, and these emails that they read were about how to perfect his recipe for a bomb. And this information, no thank you, and this, 
that and how to um, how best to put this information on uh, how to best to plant this bomb in the New York Stock Exchange and detonate it. This would be as tragic as the as 9/11, and this is completely unacceptable. This thing, the NSA, is a huge boost to security, but Edward Snowden broke it. What what he did is he released the he released pretty much the blueprints of, of the NSA to, to not only the American people, but to our enemies. He released it so that, uh, so that the, the, our, the terrorists, the, the people trying to blow up our buildings and kill our citizens are, are able to, to, he released the keywords so they know how not to, what not to say in their email so we don't find them. They released the, uh, so they also know the, the corporations uh, that are cooperating with, with the NSA, so they know who not to go through. And what he did is he just made it so much easier for these, these people trying to kill us to get, fly under the radar and not get caught by, by, the, by these, the people trying to save us. So in conclusion, like, you can't, in conclusion, he's not a hero. <laughs> <laughs> the next speaker for the government is Rachel Tukey. Hi, guys. Um, I want to say thank you guys for coming today. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking on side proposition and to continue the trend of brightly colored shirts on side proposition. We are the hippie team. Um, <laughs> So today I want to explain to you that why we are the side supporting a man who has by some been labelled as a traitor, why we instead say that Edward Snowden is a hero because he has self-sacrificed, he has given up his life with a noble intention to reveal the mass surveillance of the US government of the, on the US people and worldwide and has therefore created a better world and enabled the US people to challenge their government on these aspects. Today I want to bring to you two things to prove this. I want to extend what Amanda has said about transparency and explain how this has reevaluated the US people's relationship to their government. And secondly, I want to talk about the effects this has on a worldwide stage. Before I go into that, I'd like to offer a little bit of rebuttal to Sam on the points he brought to us, um, brought to the House today. Um, firstly, what I'd like to clarify is what the NSA have been doing, what, what actually they've been doing with this metadata, and secondly, what Snowden himself did with this. So firstly, what Sam said to us today, he said that the NSA, what they were doing was not invasive. We believe that this is a huge mischaracterization of what the NSA were doing. The NSA would have carrying out a mass surveillance of the US people. Sam has pointed to some examples where it has involved um, spying on terrorist action. This is very few of what the NSA was examining and the broad network of data they had been gathering. What they actually were doing was spying on the Facebooks and hacking the Facebooks of the majority of the US population and worldwide. They were bugging the phone of the German Chancellor. They were examining the emails of a shrimp company. Um, they were even spying on their ex-lovers. The fact is that this was a mass and indiscriminate examination of the US people that actually required very little evidence in order to achieve a warrant to take it further. So it wasn't actually just a few dodgy, sketchy people talking about dodgy, sketchy things. It was the vast majority of the US population were being kept under close and tight surveillance and control. And we believe that while the balance of the government must always be between privacy and security, what they were essentially doing was locking the US people in a cell. They were keeping the US people under mass surveillance, which is violating their freedom. So we believe that that is actually what the NSA were doing in this case. Secondly, what did Snowden do? So they've claimed that Snowden put the US government um, and the US people at risk by what he's done. So we say firstly, Snowden took a hell of a lot of evidence away from the NSA, but he only selectively revealed part of this. What Snowden revealed was enough to prove what the NSA were doing, but not enough to put any individual at risk. Compare this to the case, case of Bradley Manning with WikiLeaks. Bradley Manning indiscriminately gave all the information he had to WikiLeaks, putting many different bases at risk around the world. Instead, Snowden deliberately tried to protect the people involved in the situation. Secondly, even if Snowden has um, revealed a massive security leak in, in a NSA, what you might want to consider is that Snowden was not, imply, uh, was not employed as an intelligence officer. He was a low-level computer engineer for the NSA. If Snowden 
someone who wasn't even employed to do this and shouldn't have had access to these details is able to get access to so um, so much information. Surely this reveals a clear security flaw on the part of the NSA who should be protecting this information and, it's, and the loose protection they have put on a mass amount of information that could be on terrorists, it could be on the huge amount of the, of the American population. And this really reveals the poor, um, the poor care that they have shown this, um, the mass events they have had of the American people. Um, now on to our, my main substantial points. So what Amanda presented to you today was a metric for which we can evaluate if Edward Stone is a hero. So we put this metric in three different ways. Firstly, we believe that if someone is a hero, they must have sacrificed something. They must have given some sort of self-sacrifice. No, thank you. Secondly, we believe that they must have a noble intent. And thirdly, we believe that this must be done for a greater good and a greater empirical benefit in the world. So, just go through these points very, very quickly. Firstly, has Snowden self-sacrificed? Yes. He's clearly worse off. He's given up his family, his friends, his house in Hawaii to go live abroad in exile, away from all of these, um, all these comforts, away from his own country. And he's now labeled an exile. He's now labeled a traitor to that country and he can never return. So yes, we believe he has sacrificed. Secondly, has he done this with noble intention? Again, we say yes. He has done this because he believes that what the US government was doing was unconstitutional, was tyrannical, and needed to be revealed to the US people. And finally, has he created a better empirical world? I would like to prove this to you in two ways. By firstly talking about how he's given us greater transparency, and by second, how this has affected us on a worldwide stage. So what Amanda showed to you today was how the NSA has been indiscriminately going through and um, hacking into the Facebooks, into the private information of a wide range of US citizens. They have essentially been treating US citizens like animals, like cattle that they keep. The government is by the people and for the people. However, this has been shown that the government's been acting tyrannical of the people. Human beings, we like our privacy. We keep our diaries hidden. We close our doors. We put passwords on our computers because our actions, our movements, our private emails are extensions of ourselves. They are an expression of our freedom. And they should not be given access to a government who is simply trying to keep a close eye on every single person within it. In it. Even, we say even if this was done towards a security aim, it is to the extent that it has violated the freedom of the people. It is, it is equivalent to putting us in cement boxes just in order to protect some sort of freedom that they themselves are destroying in their action. And what has Snowden done? We believe that what Snowden has done is he has now enabled the US people. He has enabled the US people to question their relationship with their government, to say, hey, that's not okay and thereby to reevaluate their relationship, as we've seen in the reforms of the NSA that Obama announced just yesterday. Now, secondly, my next point is what he has done on a worldwide stage. Snowden revealed how the US government has been doing things such as bugging the phone of the German chancellor, such as looking on the emails of Ban Ki-moon. The fact is, they have been acting tyrannical of also other, U other nation states around the world. It has revealed the unhealthy and unhelpful relationships of distrust, of spying that are, under, that are going on on an international scale. And we believe what this has done is put a due check on those relationships. It has said, hey, we need to treat these other countries as our equals and we need to work together. Because let's face it, in the upcoming world, facing things as climate, climate change, facing economic, um, economic recessions, we need to work in unity together. And Edward Snowden has now, by putting a check on this, allowed us to reveal these unhealthy relationships and restructure them on a more equal terms in a way that we haven't really done since you guys saved our asses in World War II. <laughs> and so finally, for these reasons, for the better world he has created, for his self-sacrificing nature, we firmly believed that Edward Snowden is a hero. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the opposition is John Papantonio. It's very easy to get scared about your security. It's very easy to think that anyone who tries to protect your security is necessarily a hero and someone who has your best interests at heart. 
But Edward Snowden was not a man who acted simply for the sake of the benefit of everyone. He was not a man who revealed things that were legal abuses in a lot of instances or revealed in a way that did not harm a lot of people. He was a man who methodically chose to infiltrate a US military institution, pull out information, and then gave vast quantities of it to a lot of the enemies of the United States and the world in general, with very little regard to the way that it affected the efficacy of these programs that in many instances keep you and everyone in this room particularly safe. I'm gonna talk about a few things in this speech. The first problem that happened in this debate was people getting very confused about what PRISM is, the legality of it, and whether or not it was a good thing that we know about it. So the first thing I want to do is to make this absolutely clear how this all works. Because the concept of metadata is something that can scare a lot of people. We don't like the idea that people know who you are talking to. But we conflate that with the idea that the government is reading literally everything that you write. I'm going to be clear, Rachel, the government doesn't care what you say on Facebook to make that <laughs> overwhelmingly clear. And more than that, it's infeasible for them to actually read all of this information. The way that metadata works is like sort of the digital equivalent of reading the address that you write on a letter. The way it works is that it looks at, say, who you call, the nature of the interactions of those things. But let's talk about what the US government actually does with this information. For a start, they don't use algorithms to snoop through these things. They don't try to pick out information from it. They simply have the data there so that if they think there is something suspect, they can go through it later. Secondly, only about 20 people in higher places in the NSA have the capacity to do this, right? Documents released say that only 300 such instances take, took place in the year before Snowden released these things. And thirdly, even if you get approval, right? Even if you get approval to say, we can to go through these connections, what happens? You don't start reading through the conversations that are involved, right? You look at who somebody called if you think they're a terrorist. You look at who that person called. And if you want to do more, you then need to get a warrant. You then need to go about going through this process that requires court approval. And why do we do this? Like, this is just something that the United States does for fun. Well, why was metadata introduced? It was introduced because before 9-11, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Mintar, who were two Al-Qaeda muscle people who were on one of the 9-11 planes that went at the Pentagon, were in San Diego. They were living there. They made calls to an Al-Qaeda safe house. The United States picked up those calls. They knew they existed. They knew the contents of those calls. What they didn't know was where those calls come from, where those calls came from. They didn't know those people were in San Diego. They didn't know they were in America. They didn't know they had proximity and the capacity to inflict such a terrorist attack. After 9-11, and after we had investigations into whether or not we could have done anything better, one of the things we were criticized for was not having that information, not having the basic capacity to tell when somebody who was calling an Al-Qaeda safe house is literally in your country. That is what is at stake when you start to say these programs are unnecessary or start to compromise their efficacy. But let's talk about what actually happened as a result of this, right? Because they said, look, Obama has recently announced sweeping reforms. This is a good thing. This shows that in the end, what Snowden wanted was pure of intention, right? There were problems. Well, Obama's done two things, right? One, the government doesn't collect the metadata anymore. It's simply held with the phone companies. That literally just means if they ever want to get to it, they have to knock on the door of Verizon. It doesn't change anything substantively about the nature of the program. Secondly, they only keep the information for 18 months. Thank you for like clearing out the backlog of like kept up data that we had and probably didn't need. Because we had the conversation Snowden wanted, right? The people like you could have all entered this discussion. Everyone could have been involved. The consequence was not a substantive change of policy. So if they want to say this has helped the world, I would question how they think this works. But let's talk about like what Snowden has done instead, right? And what he could have done better. Because for a start, it wasn't true that he used up every single accountability structure that he had available to him, right? He could have gone to people internal to the NSA and asked, and asked them why these sort of things were going on. They could have said, oh, but he couldn't trust it. They just said he was like low down in the pecking order, right? So literally, this is someone who's walked in off the street, like by their conception, and then decided to say that like, oh, I am the moral arbiter of everything that the NSA is doing, not knowing the entirety of the program or why it is being used. That doesn't seem like someone is a hero. That seems like someone who brings their own moral convictions and like sense of moral rectitude and tries to apply that to a situation that is particularly complicated. But okay, let's talk about the other thing they wanted to say, bring up, which was the US is spying on other countries. They said, it's really bad that, you know, the United States spies on its allies. A few things. I would be surprised if anyone in this room was naive enough to think that 
other countries don't spy on the US. I would be surprised if anyone internal to government structures were naive enough to say that China was just like, like Xi Jinping is saying, being like, we're not gonna spy on the US because they're pretty cool guys and we respect democracy and the rule of law. <laughs> so when they say it's important that we reveal these things, I don't think it's that important insofar as it puts the US in a worse position. It puts the US in a position that makes it harder for it to do the basic things that it needs to do. And even in the instances of countries that are our friends, like people in like nations in Europe, the fact is that we need to spy on them sometimes for like self-interest, right? We might not like the way that is how international polity works, but like fun fact guys, politicians lie in public. So you sometimes need to know what they think in private if you want to do the best things for the United States. But okay, look, you might apologize to him at that, this point. You might say, well, look, there are lots of associated harms with revealing this sort of information, but who are we to say that Snowden could have understood all this? Who are we to say that Snowden could have known that like US tech companies now can't invest in Europe because people don't trust them because of his revelations? Who are we to say that he could have known that revealing these things would have compromised the efficacy of these systems? He might simply have been a man who saw what he thought was an abuse and tried to reveal it. Let's talk about that because I just don't think it's true. What did he do? He like, on the internet, it's revealed that he has like a series of particularly strong moral convictions, right? He doesn't trust government. He wants to go back to the gold standard. From my perspective, like, because I like monetary policy, that's enough for me to hate him for like, you know, prima facie. But like, okay. That aside, like, the point is that he also made like a calculated effort to integrate himself within to these programs and get information specifically for the point of revealing them. Now, at this point, you have to ask yourselves the question. If you had the capacity to integrate yourself within a structure, you had time, understanding as a, tech, like as a tech expert to know what you were going to reveal and how you're going to reveal it, do you think you might have had the capacity to know that maybe there might have been associated harms? Do you think that maybe instead of disclosing 200,000 documents and taking a laptop with the rest of them to Russia and China, where people are presumably going to get those documents, you might have behaved differently if you were indeed a hero? Do you think that maybe you wouldn't have revealed the specific nature of how the programs works? Things that don't reveal anything more substantively to the public, but only serve to make those programs unusable in the future, even if we decide they're in our best interests. Because at the end of the day, Edward Snowden could have been a hero if what he did was come across government abuse and say, I'm going to reveal the nature of that abuse, but not how it works and why it needs to stop. Instead, he chose to spend like a substantial period of time integrating himself and revealing things that harm the efficacy and safety of every aspect of the United States government. That is not something that makes him a hero. Thank you. Next for the government is Poppy Damon. Technology is not my forte, no Edward Snowden. Um, okay. When 9-11 happened, ladies and gentlemen, lots of legislation changed. In the climate of fear, lots of legislation was pushed through that we now regret. Things like indiscriminate and absolute power for the NSA to surveil, I don't know if surveil is a verb, but to watch over American people. And that is the, like, from the position that we stand on side prop. And we say that as much as the opposition want to downplay the kind of changes that we saw Obama and concessions Obama make yesterday, we think those things were significant. We think those kind of checks and balances were real things. And we think that it's an incredibly important thing that we have achieved. Moreover, we say that this is not a debate about whether like, Snowden is crazy or like, what other things he thinks about gun laws. This is a debate about whether someone is a hero when they make sacrifices of their own comfort for a net good that we're going to point to you today. We also think it's a debate that draws a clear distinction between certain concessions one makes on their privacy for security and the kind of mass surveillance we see under the NSA and under the information that was released. We also think it's an inherent assumption across the opposition bench that authority figures necessarily know what's best and that we should necessarily trust the organizations that in fact, as you point out, are outside of government controls. So we provided you a test today, right? We came up and we told you that we think that considering these actions provided were, were necessarily based on a self-sacrifice, uh, because of the fact that he had intentions to create a better world, and because he did these actions, no thank you, which led to a net, net benefit to society, we are proud to stand on side prop. So before I go into my discussion about uh, the ways in which this changes whistleblower behavior in the future and why we think that's a good thing, I'm just going to hit on some of the stuff that John just brought you. So. 
We see John trying to like build up um, him as a negative person in general, right? And like call into question whether he's a, like a reputable person. And we say in our first response, we think that often you can have simultaneously problematic views on other issues and still have made a heroic action on something specific. We see this with people like Martin Luther King, right? Like lots of people try to discredit him because he cheated on his wife for his dissertation. We still think that he's like, a, that a cause, is a hero because of the achievements he accomplished for civil rights. So we don't think it's good enough to simply problematize him as a person as a whole. Second of all, we say that we think that his uh, motivations for acting were in fact based on quite normative ideas about, uh, held by a wide amount of people. That things like privacy are good, and I'm going to explain why in, later in my speech. We also think that like, it's obviously on the side, the side oppositions, they're incentivized to actually downplay and exaggerate how much this was uh, beneficial to our security. But we think when they look at examples like what was their example? The ones that they, they drew upon were actually ones that like, were provided by Scotland Yard. And the reason that Obama could, hasn't been able to name one single benefit of these kind of prison programs is because there is none, right? If they had a really winning example, Obama would have probably provided it and been like, look guys, we stopped this Times Square bomber. But in fact, it's never been based on the kind of surveillance that we've seen released under the NSA. No thanks. Moreover, we say that like, um, in fact, I'm going to skip over and get straight to my other stuff because the other stuff's embedded. Cool. So, why do we think that it's good that this kind of, we've changed the relationship uh, between uh, individuals who work for uh, things like the NSA in the future? And like, why is this going to inspire other whistleblowers? And we say that when we had the WikiLeaks, br br uh, WikiLeaks break, we saw people like Bradley Manning, uh, it caused a great amount of debate about whether or not he was actually uh, doing a good thing. And we see that in previous historical in instances, people used the defense of like acting under orders, right? So people were like, I'm really sorry I, I did all this really bad stuff, but I was told to do so by an authority figure. And we say that what Snowden has actually done is actually provided an individual conscience for the people who work for those organizations. I.e., if you come under, uh, you've come in contact with something that you think is quite questionably moral, you ask your superiors and are continually silenced, which, as much as the opposition want to downplay, like Snowden has evidence that he did discuss it with people and wasn't provided legitimate justification for doing so. We say that we think this is a really good thing. We think that just because you were following orders does not remove your culpability as an individual. And we think that like, Snowden transformed this in a really radical way. We also think that this sets, therefore sets an important precedent for the future. I'll take you now, sure. Do you think a culture of people infiltrating security organizations specifically to leak information is a good thing for America? We don't think that this provides a culture of like allowing external bodies to infiltrate in this way. What we think is someone who is hired by the NSA and finds that as a very low level official can penetrate information that they in fact think was gained on questionable basis, we think they do have a moral responsibility to release this and I'm going to explain further in a second. So we say like the best way, in one way to prove this is to take it to the extreme. So we say that, say that Snowden had in fact found that American government was like poisoning British uh, American citizens. We would say that in that instance most people would agree he had a moral duty to discuss disclose that information. So we say that we think this works on a similar basis, right? Because he's, he's provided information that he thinks like causes lots of net harms, that he thinks the great uh, grand populace of America might have problems with, he had a moral duty to in fact uh, demonstrate and show that information to a broader audience. In the same way that we hear from Tribe Prop, that like, if you have nothing to fear, you have nothing to hide. And they say that classic thing of like, oh, Rachel, they don't want to read your text from your boyfriend. We say that like, in the same way, the government, if they have nothing to hide, have nothing to fear as well. Like, by telling us the mechanisms in which they carry out this mass surveillance, we think that it actually does put power back into the people's hands to decide whether we do consent, in fact, to this type of surveillance. Maybe it may be that we do consent. Perhaps people say, actually, yeah, it's fine. I completely, uh, you know, forego my right to privacy. I think this is fine. But that choice should rely on the American people consenting to that right being taken away. So we think that, like, uh, in that instance, this stands. Moreover, we'd like to provide a case study to why we don't think that the NSA always knows what's right. We look at organizations like the FBI and the CIA, and historically we've seen that every time these documents are released, we are horrified at the kind of actions they carried out in our name. We see this with things like the surveillance of Martin Luther King by the FBI. We see this like the things carried out by Hoover uh, in much earlier periods. We say that why we think this is better for the future is that instead of like the military who continually suppress like whistleblowing, right? They think it's a really bad thing. We think actually it is an incredibly heroic thing because we think that you should be morally culpable for the individual actions you carry out even under orders. We think people should use the fact that they, we are, uh, you are acting in a collective but in fact uh, enact these policies as an individual and should do things to, to, for the moral good. 
Moreover, we think that because this has, uh, as Rachel touched upon, transformed the position on the US stage, and John wanted to say, oh guys, whatever, like everyone's spying, so it's okay if we do it. We don't think that's good enough. We think this has meant more pressure on governments. And even if those changes are minor now, we can't see what that will do in the future. And because the NSA now knows the fear of whistleblowers on a far greater extent, we think they might act accordingly. We think they might act in a more justified manner, and we can only hope. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker for the opposition is uh, Thomas Montefinese. And I want to note that when Thomas is done, we'll open the floor to floor debate. So if you'd like to make comments or direct questions to the panel, um, you can line up over, over here by the, by the gavel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, everyone. Before I begin, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank the audience, to the students, faculty, and visitors who are here today and also to our, uh, the students from Cambridge University and members of the Cambridge Union Society. These students came all the way from across the pond to be here today. And uh, they are seasoned debaters, I think they've proven that. And I feel honored to be debating not only against them, but with them. In addition, I would like to thank Hofstra University for offering up Monroe Hall and for hosting this event. And finally, I would like to thank the government for offering up their arguments, defending Edward Snowden. However, this IT guy with a messiah complex should not be considered a hero. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, while there has been much rhetoric bashing the NSA, so far there has been little talk of the consequences of Snowden's actions. What we are debating here today is whether or not Snowden, by leaking these documents, should be considered a hero. Now, I propose that in order to bestow the title of hero on a person, they need not be perfect in every way. They may have their flaws. You do not even have to like them. Rather, what is important is their actions, and looking at those actions under a lens. If, you hear, uh, if, a hero does something good for the, uh, the, uh, if a hero does something for the greater good of society, I believe that those goods should at least outweigh the harms that they have caused. <coughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, we could argue whether or not Adolf Hitler is a hero because he initiated government-subsidized research programs as to the adverse uh, effects of smoking. But that would be absurd, and it is absurd to stand here and argue that by compromising our national well-being, this man should be put on a pe uh, pedestal as someone to imitate and admire. Now, I myself agree that an individual's right to privacy is an important right. However, I recognize, that, and we all must recognize, that in this world that we live in, there are dangers we face that are beyond the individual's ability to control. This is why we submit to government certain powers to allow them to protect us from these threats. As a resident in the great state of New York and a stone's throw away from New York City, I do not take any risk to our national security lightly. Instances of homegrown terrorism are on the rise. Just last April, a bomb went off in the Boston Marathon, killing 13 and injuring many more. In the 21st century, with the rise of the internet and free flow of information, bomb-making recipes are readily accessible to any person with a smartphone. In today's technology, bomb-making materials become harder to detect. And the NSA's job is to protect us from those threats. According to the NSA director, John Clapper, Edward Snowden has leaked 200,000 classified documents. These documents give up certain techniques vital to maintaining our security. They give up names and locations of individuals working for the United States around the world. This endangers the lives of American citizens home and abroad. Now, once again, I am all for defending civil liberties. And if Snowden was truly brave and courageous, he would have stayed and faced the consequences. It's a little thing I like to call civil disobedience, something Martin Luther King knew about and was arrested for. If he truly was seeking to uphold our privacy rights, he could have brought the information before the ACLU or another NGO that could have brought the case before the Supreme Court or lobby Congress. But he did not leave us to pick up the, uh, he did not, leaving us to pick up the pieces of a shattered national point. defense. No, thank you. What he did do was flee to Hong Kong and sought asylum in Russia, like a rat abandoning a ship after chewing off the anchor. And if it's, <laughs> and if there is another attack on American soil, Snowden will not be there to face it. On that point? Uh, no, thank you. He puts you and I at risk. And of all places, Russia. He wants to defend civil liberties and he goes to Vladimir Putin's Russia? I'm sorry, but that's a bitter irony. I would also like to On point that out. Point. No, thank you. Again. <laughs> I would also like to point out the thousands of documents, that thousands of these documents are not even written in English, but rather a sophisticated computer language that any layperson on the street would not understand, begging the question 
how did the common American citizen gain anything positive from these leaks if we cannot even read most of the documents? In addition, now he has presented to computer hackers and terrorists around the world a blueprint to, avo to avoid detection. And aside from the physical harm, the fiscal harm, the EU is now enacting legislation to process uh, seeking to do, um, legislation to screen American companies seeking to do business with the EU, uh, costing those American companies money and costing American jobs abroad. Now, I would also like to stress to you all that this man is being accused of treason under the Espionage Act of 1917. He is being accused of a crime he may or may not be guilty of, but we won't know until he comes back to the United States and confronts a jury of his peers. But even if we consider this man a hero, what message does that send to society as a whole? Is it okay to emulate this man, what he has done? In the Supreme Court case of Schenck versus the United States, Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes expressed his concern that certain speech can lead to a clear and present danger to our nation's security. I argue the resolution itself, by calling Edward Snowden a hero, is in itself a clear and present danger. By calling this man a hero, it sends a message to future generations that it is okay to harm others. It is okay to lie to your fellow coworkers and steal their login codes. It is okay, it is heroic to betray your fellow countrymen. No, this cannot stand for reason. What I propose is we look at the harm Edward Snowden has caused and weigh that against the good that has come of it. And I think, and think of the harm that the resolution presents in calling Edward Snowden a hero. And for this reason, I urge you to oppose the resolution. Thank you. At this time, if any of you have comments or questions uh, for, the, for the panel, please. Come up. <laughs> okay. So I briefly heard this point brought up about um, because of these documents being released by the NSA, it potentially harms American businesses. In fact, the New York Times, I believe, in an article on Saturday stated that companies like Microsoft can no longer do business in Brazil because of the threat of the NSA looking at data or that certain American companies have to move their data centers overseas. Because the economy or just any economic indicators is something the average person definitely feels and that every single person feels and that a hero should try to allow for, a hero should try to allow to provide for a service to people, one of which is to have a sound economic standing. Can this please be brought up more so on how the economic ramifications of the release of these NSA documents should play in today's round? Thank you. So I'd like to ask the affirmation a question. So is privacy a prerequisite for life? Okay. Uh, may I pick up on a point that Poppy raised and ask the opposition if they would consider this? She talked about the extreme hysteria after 9-11 when the so-called USA Patriot, Patriot Act was passed. And my question is whether we needed more Edward Snowden's then. Because when that act was passed, no one actually saw a printed copy of it. They were asked to vote on it without seeing it. They were so terrified. A few members of Congress insisted on having a printed copy. I think it ran to hundreds of pages. And when they insisted on it, it was brought from the printer. It was so hot they could barely hold it in their hands. But almost no one read it. And we could have used an Edward Snowden to, ex to examine the extreme aspects earlier about what was passed. And finally, also to the opposition, the FISA court existed before the so-called USA Patriot Act. Almost no Americans knew about it. It's a secret court. Do we want an aristocracy of the robe making those decisions? Now at least people are aware of what went on with the FISA court. I would just, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I would just like to, um encourage the affirmation to take on the point of whether or not um, it's relevant that Edward Snowden um, revealed information about America's security. So I know that the opposition raised this point, um, and I think it's a very important point, and I hope you guys are going to address this, because um, I think really central to this is, yes, maybe Edward Snowden was a hero to the United States if the United States was floating in a free universe with no other competition, but um, I think once you put it into perspective of other nations having their own security, um, having their own spy networks, I think it is important to address that point in order to strengthen your argument. Um, and I'm considering this in the context of, I know that the United States 
um, National Security Agency works in conjunction with Canada, works in conjunction with Australia's own security um, organizations. And so when you consider that not just the United States, but also the security of Canada, of Australia, of per, um, possibly Scotland Yard are all kind of brought into this together. Um, and you know, when you're looking at a world where maybe we're on the edge of a second Cold War, I think uh, it's worth considering um, what is the impact of that revel of those revela revelations on the United States security to other countries surrounding it. Okay, so this is just something for the affirmative, based off of their definition of, of a hero, as you put it, as someone who should be idolized. So, if he, if, according to your definition, he was someone idolized. Snowden was not idolized, nor was he even allowed to stay in the country. Now, I'll probably sit there as protest stuff and leave it, right? Protest by which percentage of people? If you look at the resolution from a purely utilitarian perspective, there would have to be greater than 50% of America protesting. There wasn't. Therefore, he was not idolized, so there would have been more objection to him being run out of the country on a rail. Therefore, by your own definition, Snowden is not a hero. All right, I have a question for the opposition. When government tends to have a lot of power, it is historically accurate to say that it generally caused the downfall of civilization. If you truly value privacy, how do you justify government and other companies buying our private information and making our social security readily available? Isn't it important to have an idea of how um, our information is being shared in order to better to protect ourselves as American citizens? My question is, if Snowden is, if Snowden is actually a hero, why did he decide to take all the information he collected and the 200 classified documents from the NSA to known enemies of the US like Russia and China? And how can we consider him a champion of individual privacy when he hacked into the government's database and stole people's individual logins to do all of this? And I guess something that we've been talking about is sort of the between privacy and security, and I think we all agree we can't go to one extreme on each side of the spectrum. And I was wondering if both sides could kind of elaborate on where they see uh, the optimal balance would be as far as how much privacy we need versus security. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the uh, closing arguments will now be made and we'll begin uh, with the government's position pr uh, presented by Rory Deering. All right, um, I would like to again thank you all for being here. Um, and Hofstra and the Cambridge University Society for helping this uh, de debate to take place. So, uh, this house believes that Edward Snowden is a hero because he has committed, uh, he has sacrificed his own comfort. He has the intentions of creating a better world and his actions have led to an, a net benefit to society. But to, first to address some of the questions asked by the audience. Um, is privacy a prerequisite for life? No, but it is a prerequisite or a right given to us as American citizens in the Constitution. And as citizens of this country, we deserve that right. Um, this is given in examples like the case of Roe v. Wade, where you have the privacy to decide what goes into your body and the Bill of Rights, specifically the Fourth Amendment, saying that you are secure in your home and your effects, and as was earlier referenced. Um, and the question about Snowden not being idolized, that is false. Um, he was invited to speak at South by Southwest, a very influential event in this country. He was invited to speak at a large TED conference. Uh, again, a very influential event. Um, and the fact that he fled to Russia, he was seeking uh, Point refuge. of information. No, thank you. He was seeking refuge, and Russia accepted his application uh, with the, uh, the stipulation that he no not um, continue harming the U.S., as they put it. Uh, now on to my own points. 
so we've uh, uh, gone over the test of a hero. That the actions involve self-sacrifice. That's obvious. Snowden gave up his comfortable lifestyle in Hawaii, earning six figures a year, to go live in Russia. And obviously he's not earning six figures a year. He's not near his family. He doesn't have the comforts of home or the rights given to an American citizen. <clears throat> Secondly, he had intentions of a better world. He went in seeking to find this, uh, this violation of the American people's privacy. He went in knowing that a moral wrongdoing had occurred and that in revealing this, um, this wrongdoing, no thank you, um, he would uh, lose his own security, his own privacy, he would become a public figure. Uh, and lastly, the, this, uh, this whole situation led to a net benefit for society. So they'll have you believe that the NSA's programs were giving us greater security, but the fact is they have provided no, informa or no proof to this point. Uh, the terrorist of Zazi referenced, again, caught by Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard contacted the FBI. The NSA was not involved in that case. Um, so even in... Uh, a, review set, or a session with the White House review panel, the NSA presented no evidence that the prison program had actually caught any terrorists or stopped any attacks. So how can we be giving up security if no, there was no benefit to security from this program in the first place? Um, and people have been saying a lot of things about the NSA's programs, but they have been leaving out the fact that the US government for a period of at least a year was tracking GPS locations of citizens. Didn't have a reason to, just decided to do it. Um, let's see. And the, the prison program is in fact dragnet surveillance, which is basically collecting all the data you can get your hands on and hoping that you can pick out a little pearl, look mom, I found a terrorist. <laughs> um, so, Snowden has also not affected security because he selectively released documents. He may have released 200,000, but we don't know how many documents he was actually in possession of. So he selectively released documents hope it, or knowing that he was not going to harm any of our agents abroad or any of our um, interests in that sense. But the question about the economic interests of the United States, um, it, they have stated that People already knew this was happening, they just didn't have proof. If that's the case, then why does the fact that, now we definitely know what's happening, affect anything at all? Because you, you're just... Point of information. Uh, fine, yes. Um, well, the EU is actually enacting, in the EU Parliament, they're enacting uh, legislation to screen all our companies. This is going to lose contracts for American businesses, and it's going to hamper... Um, making money for American citizens abroad. If you want to have a job abroad, it's going to be difficult. So, uh, that, that is no different from the trade agreements we have with certain parts of the world that make it easier to make money with them and specifically send our business to them, uh, avoiding certain countries like um, in Africa and other places. Uh, let's see. And um, lastly, uh, we've talked about spying on companies, spying on people. But what about spying on terrorists? Any terrorist who does not believe they are under surveillance is an idiot. <laughs> they know they're doing something wrong. Obviously, they're going to have a paranoia that they're being watched. So the programs that are in place to catch them, yes, they take this into account, but they know that they are being watched. So they are going to be very careful about their actions anyways. Um, and again, the fact that this program caught not a single terrorist that we know of um, is very telling. So in conclusion, um, there was no security gained from this. The only thing lost was privacy. Thank you. The final argument uh, presented will be presented uh, by Matt Hazel for the opposition.
Okay, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> the government gave us three propositions, three things that they said make someone a hero. They said, you know, we can talk about their intent, we can talk about self-sacrifice, and we can talk about the de deeds that result from that. And what we have conclusively shown on the opposition side is why Edward Snowden fails not one, but all three of these tests. And that's what I'm going to do in my speech today. Before I do that, a couple of things about the floor debate that don't fit neatly into my reply speech. So the first speaker asked us about the Patriot Act. Did we need more Snowdens then? Well, the first thing we would say is like, to the extent that we might have needed more Snowden Zen, it's clearly a very different example to what we're talking about now, right? If the measure of a man is done by his deeds, it's not comparable to pick, you know, had Snowden leaked this information, he might have been a hero, but he didn't. He leaked the information we're talking about. Moreover, we say we fixed like quite a lot of the problems of the Patriot Act over time. So we don't think that's less, we think that's less of an issue. Secondly, on Pfizer, right? Firstly, we just need secret courts, right? Because there are often cases, particularly the kinds of cases we're talking about, like Edward Snowden, right? When we're talking about treason, when state secrets are involved, that can't directly go through the public court system. They need to be vetted first to concern whether this kind of evidence can be admissible in a public court or whether it is too damaging to US security. In that to interest. Moreover, there have been four congressional reviews since 2005 on the function, nature, and operation of these Pfizer courts, right? So it's not like without Snowden, nobody knew they existed. We knew they existed, we knew roughly what the, we, they were doing, and we don't know any more about them than we did already. Um, next, how do we publicly just how do we justify companies collecting uh, your info, your Facebook data, your Facebook messages? Well, the first thing to say is this isn't the NSA. The second thing to say is that if you don't want Facebook to collect information on your messages, don't use Facebook. You don't have some kind of inherent right to Facebook or using Google. These are private companies that you sign a terms of service, a contract when you join that service that says they can collect this information. So that information exists in the hand of these companies, whether you like it or not, whether the NSA exists or not. So what makes a hero? Three things. Firstly, let's consider the intent of Edward Snowden, because I'm not going to bore you with a seven-minute lecture on Immanuel Kant and the categorical, categorical imperative, but we'd say that in general, you know, the purity of intent can confer morality on your deeds, and so given that we don't think Snowden had purity of intent, given that we don't think Snowden did this because of some kind of abject moral higher authority that he thought he was saving, he doesn't have purity of intent. Why? Because what he did was ultimately self-interested. He's a man with a mediocre job as, as, with like access to some information. And he systematically worked his way up the hierarchy in order to get more information with the specific purpose of leaking that information, right? He knew as a security expert the kind of problems that releasing those documents would cause, but he did so anyway. So he knew what would happen when he did it, but he did it anyway. He could have given this information to the ACLU or something. He could have gone, tried to go through the court system, but instead he took his laptop and he went to the US's biggest enemies in the world today. True civil disobedience, as was pointed out earlier, tend to stay, right? He's He's just a man with some arbitrary personal morality complex which doesn't line up with the collective morality that we would say that we have in America. And moreover, we don't think an individual piece of morality is like a good justification for having purity of intent or purity of purpose and so being a hero anyway. Because when we consider the second criterion they give us, that is of sacrifice, we can think of quite a few people who had purity of moral intent in their own heart and knew what they were doing was right for them and who gave up a very, like a large amount of, you know, personal things, personal affects, in many cases their life. We don't think that someone who has has purity of intent and then sacrifices their life is automatically a hero. Why? Because let's consider a big group of people who give up their lives on a daily basis to fight what they think is their own moral purity battle. Let's think of someone, ooh, I don't know, Osama bin Laden. He died because of a moral cause that he subscribed to. He gave up everything he had because of the moral cause that he subscribed to. So just because you sacrifice everything doesn't make you a hero. Just because you believe what you're saying doesn't make you a hero. Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda are not heroes. But what they did do was sacrifice their lives and everything they held dear because of a moral cause that they thought was important. Moreover, did he actually give up everything? No, of course he didn't, right? What's he got now? He's got fame, he's got money, he's got a legacy, he's got a platform to espouse his own political nah. views. Moreover, he's doing things like speaking at TED conferences, becoming the rector of Glasgow University. His life, in a substantive sense, is considerably better than it was before. The only difference now is that he's living in a different country, right? So, as was pointed out before, the best characterization that we've had of Edward Snowden so far is an IT guy with a messiah complex. So, we've shown that his intent or sacrifice is not sufficient to be called a terrorist on their own or because of what he did. So what did he do, right? The first thing that these guys have claimed that Edward Snowden has helped with is some kind of discussion about public policy and discussion about the nature of spying and whether that's problematic. Um, the problem is that in Amanda's speech, when she brought this up, 
She also said, but we already knew that the US was spying on our partners and we already knew that these kinds of things were going on. So we haven't informed the discussion. We knew, as was pointed out in Poppy Speaks, the terrorists were already paranoid. They knew that they were being spied upon. The important thing is they didn't know how they were being spied upon. He did not fuel a discussion. He merely gave the keys to America's security backdoor to the, to the exact people who we don't want to have it. Moreover, ah, they said, ah, but the extent of, you know, the interpretation of this constitutional amendment has been passed. As was pointed out earlier, Miller versus the USA, 1976, right? It was already a precedent that these kinds of things were not private information, right? When it's in the hands of the company, when every single employee of Facebook could have read those messages anyway, right? You don't have some kind of inherent right to privacy to something that you plaster all over the web and give to a private company in the first place. So we have an informed discussion. We haven't informed how we interpret these um, methods. All we have done is tell people what they were. So what have we done? 200,000 documents. Has he read and analyzed each of these in detail? Obviously not, because that would take more than his lifetime to do so. Next, uh, Rory said, ah, oh, but we don't know how many he did have. He could have had more and only released some. Well, guess who does know how many documents he did have and could have released to the public but didn't? China, Russia, the places where he took his laptop with all those documents on too. Right? So, when he takes it does, what does he do? He makes it vulnerable. And it's not okay for Roy to say, well, Russia said when they took him in, well, we'll take him in, but you're not allowed to leak any more documents, Edward Snowden. Because if this debate has proved anything, it's that governments lie to their people, right? And governments lie in public. So if they seriously think that Russia isn't trying to get every single piece of information it can out of Edward Snowden, then they are very, very wrong indeed. So, what else does he do? He revealed the fact that we spy on the EU, or America spies on the EU, but we knew that anyway, and the EU is spying on the US anyway. So all they've done is make it harder for American companies or, or for, firstly for American companies to do business in these regions but moreover for America to like spy and compete on a world scale when countries like China are happily willing to do it against us right Poppy says if governments have nothing to hide then we shouldn't hide stuff but we do have things to hide Poppy they're called state secrets right we don't tell people what our troop movements are we don't reveal the codes to our nuclear weapons in the same way that we don't reveal the exact tactics that we use to catch terrorists so when he does give the exact methods that we use to catch terrorists into the hands of al-Nusra, al-Shabaab, Jamaat Islamia, and al-Qaeda, right? When he gives those things to North Korea and China and Russia and Iran, all that they do is now they know how to avoid being spied upon. They were already paranoid. Now they know exactly what to do to not be caught. All he has done, right? All he has done is make it much easier for the enemies of America to avoid the security systems that we had in place. Every technique that Scotland Yard used is one that PRISM uses as well, right? So any examination or con concession on how we spy with PRISM is a concession about how we spy in Scotland Yard. He's made it less safe for US citizens and the citizens of the entirety of the Western world. For those reasons, we urge you to oppose. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. My name is Warren Forsyth. I'm the Dean of the Honors College here. And um, first of all, let's have a round of applause again for these splendid speakers. <laughs> you see on the screen, we have put up um, new codes, same, same phone number. It's time for you to text in your response to uh, today's debate. You may, and I figure if I do it at the same time, by the time I'm done, you'll be done, right? I'm in, are you in? Okay, it's time for us to discover um, how the House feels about these questions. Uh, give me one second here. Okay, before the debate began, this were the responses. Ooh. A dead tie, <laughs> 17 to 17 got across, okay? So now let's see what we have in the after category. Up. Oh, in this case, <laughs> the House sees.
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, and let's, uh, let's have some more applause for our speakers. Um, we just want to take this opportunity to thank Hofstra for hosting us, and specifically the individuals that uh, made this all possible. So for Simon, we've got uh, some home comforts, Jaffa cakes and English tea. Um, so thank you so much for giving us such a great time and amazing debate. And of course for Phil as well, uh, good luck for all the debates and we hope you'll have us again. And we've got a, just a little something for you as well, Cambridge souvenir book. <laughs> so thank you so much.